You may be seated. So, you know, I think that uh, Pomp and Circumstance is the only song in the world that can be however long you need it to be. If it needs to be an hour and a half, it can be an hour and a half. Good evening. My name is Jim Hill. I'm the pastor of First Methodist Church of Stigler. I want to welcome you to the baccalaureate service honoring the 2024 class of Stigler High School. Let us uh, open with a word of prayer. Most holy God, we do give you thanks and praise for this glorious day that you have given to us. Oh God, every day is a gift from you, but this day is very special. It is special for all that you are doing in the life of these young people, oh God, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that they began their high school career in the midst of a pandemic, and yet they come out on the other side with great joy and great honor. And oh God, we pray that you will be with us now that you will be with Jason as he comes to bring the message, that you will be with the families and parents of those that are here, uh, that you will uh, fill their hearts with even more love that they have for their loved ones. And I pray, oh God, that you will be with the graduates, that you will bless them, that you will open their hearts and minds that they might hear tonight the word that you have for them that as they prepare to graduate in two days, uh, you will be with them, O oh God, that you will guide and direct them, uh, not just through graduation, but through uh, the upcoming years of their lives. And we pray all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. It is not on the schedule, but we are going to do something just a little different. I want to ask um, Eric Stout to come. Uh, you have had, this class has had a great tragedy over, well, I guess it's been 24 hours maybe, and uh, I think Eric is going to come and lead us in prayer for that. Uh, let's go to God in prayer for the, the Labor family tonight. Lord, we uh, come before you, Lord. This is a, a time of year, Lord, where we come in and, and there's excitement and anticipation and joy, but we also come here tonight with heavy hearts with one of our own that is hurting tonight and, and a family that we love that is hurting. And Lord, we pray um, for Case and Lord, we pray and we thank you, Lord, that you're God that hears our prayers and, and you answer prayer. And Lord, we pray for a, a touch in his body, but we also pray for the family. I pray, God, that you would wrap your loving arms around them, Lord, that you would be their source of strength and comfort and peace. Lord, I'm thankful that uh, we love you because you first loved us. We're grateful, Lord, that you will never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You're a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, I pray that you would also be with these seniors and, and, uh, and give them comfort as well. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jason Smith is going to come the pastor here at First Assembly. Uh, you may not have been at baccalaureates before. A lot of times there's like a slideshow and special music and all kinds of things. We, uh, we think Jason eliminated all those so that he can talk as long as he wants to. <laughs> is, that, is that correct? Never know. Never know. Okay. All right. So let me turn it over to him. Thank you. I just, can y'all hear me back there? There we go. They're already trying to mute me. Man, I love Stigler. Stigler is a very special place. Um, tonight's a, as, a, as a night that I'm speaking uh, as a pastor, but also as, as a dad. Um, I'm not a very emotional person. And so last night I was kind of reading through uh, the notes and uh, just kind of looking through a few things and uh, found myself saying, you know what, I just need to go, go to bed. But tonight is a, it's a remarkable night for the beginning stages of the next phase of life. Now, I realize that graduation week, much like tonight, uh, is a lot like your wedding day. Uh, when you get married, you don't remember anything. Come on. You don't remember anything that preacher said. Us guys, we're thinking about the honeymoon, right? And the wife is thinking about just getting all of the details over. So you don't really remember um, there's a very few things that I do remember uh, about my wedding day, and that was how beautiful my wife looked. I don't know how I got so lucky, but man, God has been good, amen, to me. And I do remember how beautiful she looked, but man, I don't remember anything that preacher said that day. 
Um, uh, I just knew I was blessed and honored uh, to be able to get married to a woman that loved God, loved Jesus, amen. And, um, and so tonight I pray that um, just over the next two or three hours as I preach this, I'm just kidding, not two or three hours. Um, over the next few moments though, uh, that, that maybe just a few things that I say kind of just kind of sticks with you uh, moving forward uh, in life. Um, Stigler, this, this class right here um, is the class in which we, it represents when we first moved to Stigler. Uh, we moved uh, to Stigler in 2015. And, um, you know, when you're kind of the outsider moving in, now, hold on, pause. Don't count this as sermon time. This ain't sermon time, all right? But I, as, I, as I moved to Stigler, you really don't know what to expect. Are they going to receive you? Are they going to accept you? Are you an outsider? Are they, are they, you know, you don't really know. It's kind of a nerve wracking situation. Uh, but we moved to Stigler and where we came from, which was uh, Ida Bell, the McCurtain County area. Christian was at the latter part of his third grade. We really didn't have organized football for that age. And so the first thing is, I thought, man, I need to toughen my boy up. He's never been able to play football. And so we signed him up for Little League football. And uh, we met a guy by the name of Barry Hamlin. Adam Engel, Jeff Murrow, Brother Jeff, and uh, Jeremy Bush. And uh, these guys, you know, invited us in and let Christian suit up in the, the football pads. And uh, we just always have had this philosophy, whether or not we get to play or not, we're going to look good not playing. And, uh, and so that's how we did. You know, the jersey wasn't real dirty, so we played football. And those guys were awesome. They accepted us and let us uh, uh, play football. And after the end of that season, uh, Christian said, Dad, I don't think I'm going to play football. And I said, why? And he said, well, I'm really just not into getting hurt very much. And so uh, we laid the, we retired early from the football career. And so then we met, I was at Walmart here in Stigler. How many of you know a lot of great conversations happen at Walmart? <laughs> and so I'm walking down the bread aisle, just trying to get bread, minding my own business. And I run into a guy by the name of, of Tyson Cardell. And Tyson said, hey, I, I know you guys just moved here. Uh, does your son play baseball? And I said, well, if that's what you want to call it and he said hey we got a team called the A's and so they invited us to play so we played baseball with the A's and so Christian always enjoyed basketball and so we we transitioned from football to um, uh, to to baseball and then we said well, hey let's let's play basketball so we found out Stigler had this booster hoopster thing right and so but the challenge was everybody already had their team set and so I ran into a gentleman by the name of Brad Risenhoover and I said, man, I need to find, I need to find Christian a, a team to play for. And he said, I got the perfect fit for you. He said, I got, a, I got some kids um, that, that don't have a coach. And so, you know, every kid needs a coach, right? What a, you know, we just need somebody to coach these babies. And he said, hey, I'll, we'll get you a place to practice, right? All you got to do, Coble, is just coach them. I said, okay, sure. So this is us, boy. We was rolling deep. Boy, look at us. Not one of them had ever played a form of organized basketball in their life. So you, you see Christian there, like he just won the national title. The fact is, the reality was this, was we had a bunch of boys that had never, never played really a whole lot of basketball in their days. But this was, was Stigler to me, and that is that, that we embrace everybody. We love everybody. Everybody gets an opportunity and a chance. And so we... I wish I could stay here and say, man, I took these boys that had never played basketball and we went undefeated. First game, we didn't score. The second game, I think Christian got fouled and hit one of, of two free throws. Third game, we didn't score. Fourth game, we didn't score. I mean, we were breaking records, but not in a good way. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so, but boy, I was just being positive. Jesus loves you. You know, let's just play some basketball. And, you know, by the time we got back then, Boosters had a, had a, a tournament and, and, and we played that. And everybody wanted to play us because they knew it was a guaranteed win, right? And so, like I was praying and fasting, Lord, let us at least, at least be competitive. You know what I'm saying? And so, man, that final game of the year, we scored. Come on, y'all. We scored 16 points. Woo, come on. Now, the other team scored like 90. But I ain't hating on them, right? We scored 16 points, and that was a victory. Whether we won a game or not, man, we did something. Now, I prayed for Brad Risenhoover every time since he put that team together because I'm competitive. 
and we didn't win nothing, but I love each and every one of them boys. But it was during this period of time right here, we had been here probably eight months, something like that, but Stigler really revealed their character. If you give a community, enough, now remember this isn't my preaching time, but if you give a community enough time, they will show you who they are. So this team was so horrible. There was a basketball team. There was a fifth and sixth grade basketball team. They were called the Pirates. There was a Pirate baseball team, a Pirate basketball, but they just whooped everybody. But listen, we were getting beat so bad that there were, there were I know at least two young men in this class right here, Blaine, Mason Jones, and I, I can't remember, but they felt so bad for us. One night, they showed up at the grade school and said, hey, we want to help you guys get better. And so, so I mean, I, I recruited Mason because he was like 15 foot taller than everybody else. I just needed a big guy, right? And, and so he had never played basketball. But, but these young men showed up that evening, and I had eight kids or however many it was. And uh, I could just, I just, that spoke to me what kind of community that Stigler was. That even though this other team was very good and excelled at whatever they did, whether it was baseball or basketball or, or football, saw something that they wanted to make an impact and to make a difference. And then, isn't that how we should all be? That's how we should be as a community. You know, tonight, as we pray for this, this precious family that's going through a challenging moment, this is an opportunity for us as a community to, to, to do similar to what we see in that picture. And that is we rally together and we pray for one another and we lift one another up. Stigler is such a wonderful community. I spoke with, with, with Corey Labor today, and as we, we prayed over Kaysen, and his words to me was that he has been blown away by, by the love and the response of Stigler and the love that has been shown towards his family, and e even though they hadn't lived here a very long period of time. Stigler's a wonderful place, isn't it? It's a great place. It's not a perfect place. Can I get a witness tonight? But it's a great place. It's a great place to live. Uh, just this last August, I started the, the journey of trying to, to achieve my master's degree, and I've been pursuing what is known as a, a practical theology degree, and uh, I did so for a few reasons. One of the things was I wanted, to prove to, I wanted to prove to my kids that if dad can do it, anybody can do it. Now, I will say this, that when I graduated high school, I graduated in the top three of my class. That's pretty good, isn't it? The problem is there wasn't but three, and I was number three, amen. But as I began to submit this past week a 3,000-word 3, research paper that kind of built around the thought of evangelizing your community or reaching your, your community, it required me to research the history of our town, to kind of look back at our history and look at the, the various things that our community has went through. And as I began to do my research, I discovered that, that no matter what has come against our community, whether it was the Great Depression or some other form of, of things, COVID-19, all of these, various, whatever the adversity may have been, we are a community that, that rallied together. And I don't know about you, but I am proud, proud to be a part of that, proud to be a part of something that makes a difference. As I said a moment ago, Stigler isn't perfect, just like I'm not perfect. And most of you that follow Panther Vision will find out real quickly that Jason, the preacher at First Assembly, is not perfect, right? I have to repent many times after those games, but that's when I'm thankful for the grace of Jesus. Amen. But tonight we, we come here, we, we rally together, and I just wanted to, man, I just wanted to take this moment just to say, uh, that we love this community, whether you come to this, the powerful thing of this community, whether you're a part of First Assembly or the Methodist or First Baptist or any other, other church, we rally together. And on behalf of the Ministerial Alliance, we want each and every one of you to know we love you. Can we give Stigler a good hand clap tonight? Thank you for, for loving us. Thank you for loving our family. Thank you for uh, just loving these children, these young people. They're not children no more, all right? Uh, but thank you for loving them, and thank you for, for being here. Now, that was not the sermon. I've had 18 years, 18 years to think about what I wanted to preach tonight as one that sits in this class is, is, is mine. And if I was to, to give it a title, if I was to give it a message title tonight, I would call it Voices. 
And if I was to put a subtitle to that, I would ask the question that is, uh, who or what voice are we, are we listening to? Navigating through various seasons within our, our life, whether it is a good season or a, a challenging season, I've learned that the voice that we listen to will always be important. Throughout our life, we are, we are trained. We are trained to identify and to listen to certain voices, whether it is intentionally taught to us or not. I remember when my daughter was around, she's 12 going on 26 now, and, and I remember when she was around two years of age, we were living in Hayworth, and, and, I, and I came home, had a busy day, and, and as I got home, I, I, I did what any fat, overweight preacher does, I go straight to the refrigerator. And as I go to the refrigerator, I'm looking for something to eat. And, and, and everybody in the house knew that I had come home. And, and I was looking in the refrigerator and I was trying to find something to, to snack on. When all of a sudden I felt this tiny hand reach over my shoulder. What I noticed rather quickly was that two-year-old little girl of mine had heard that dad had come home. He heard, she heard my voice, but I had not known that she needed my attention. So while I was searching through the refrigerator looking for something to eat, she got a bar stool, climbed up on top of the bar stool, got on top of, of the shelf and, and walked all the way across the, the, the countertop. And right there at the end of the countertop was where the refrigerator was. And it was there where she finally got to me and reached my shoulder. Stella heard my voice and came straight to me. Unintentionally, I had ignored her. So in her desperation, she got that bar stool. She stood on top of it. She climbed to the counter where there I was, and she reached for me. As you guys, man, as you, as you transition, as you begin to, to move on to the next phase of your life, you must make a decision right now. And that decision is, is what voice are you going to listen to? What voice as you transition from this phase of your life to the next one, what voice are you going to entertain and what voice are you going to respond? You see, this is the reality. Your decisions, all of our decisions will determine the successes or the failures, the failures of, of your life. You see what I've learned, and most of you already know this, but the decisions that we, we make are either, uh, the, it either has the capacity to, to have a positive impact or a negative consequence. I learned that, I learned at a young age that, that um, I, I liked two things growing up, three or four years of age. I, I like going to showbiz pizza. Most of y'all don't know what showbiz pizza is. That's Chuck E. Cheese now. But back in the days, it was showbiz. And showbiz was a place they didn't have buffet, but we would just go and we would have a great time. I love showbiz pizza. Now they transition it to Chuck E. Cheese. But I love showbiz. I love Chuck E. Cheese because that's where a kid could just be a kid. You know what I'm saying? But not only did I like showbiz or, or Chuck E. Cheese, but I also like Toys or Us. Now, and some of you, they don't know about Toys or Us, but that's a place where, where you could go and 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 man you could just have a good time seeing all kinds of toys but I'll, I'll never forget uh, there was one time my dad who he passed away when I was young but I was I don't know two or three years of age and and one time my dad took me to, to Toys R Us I was I was like three years old and the last thing he told me because I had this problem and that is that anytime I sense freedom I, I went after it so my dad looked at me and he said my dad's name was Billy and he said Jason he said when we go into this store you better not better not leave my side I said, yeah, daddy, all right, all right, I'll do it, I got you. So we get in Toys R Us, and my dad looks this way, and I go that way. Now, I never, I never truly think about anything. In fact, back then, Transformers was huge, and, and I, I get to the Transformers, and I'm sitting there, and folks, listen, I'm just minding my own business. I'm looking at Optimus Prime. I'm looking at Bundle. I'm not tearing nothing up. I'm just looking. I hear all of these voices. I hear people talking and talking about, I want this and I'm going to do it. But all of a sudden, a voice that was above all other voices was a man by the name of Billy. And he said, Jason, where are you? And I'm going to tell you folks, I'm just keeping it real. Every other voice went quiet. And the only voice, even though there were other voices speaking, the only one I heard was the voice of Billy. About that time, Billy came over, and he had a demonic instrument that he wore around his waist called the Billy Belt. <laughs> the Billy Belt, I don't know, the Billy Belt because it was a leather belt that had his name engraved on the back of it. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. 
And the next thing I know is my dad looks at me and he said, boy, I thought I told you not to leave my side. And I said, dad, I didn't hear you. He said, oh yeah, you did. And all of a sudden that demonic instrument known as the billy belt began to saturate my behind from the back of the store to the front, <laughs> all the way out to that pinto that we had out in the parking lot. If I can preach it, I'm telling you, he beat me from one end of Toys R Us. I'm telling you right now, DHS, HHS, and WWE, all of them would be called if that happened today. But my, my point is this, and I, I know this is supposed to be a sermon. I'm going to get to some scripture, I promise. But that night, that day rather, did not end well for me. But it taught me a lesson for that day. And the lesson that it taught me was, is that the voice we listen to has an impact on our lives. And as you guys, man, as you, you transition to the next phase of your life, you're, you're going to hear a lot of different voices. As you begin to navigate through life, you're going to have various voices that are going to speak to you and try to guide your life. But always remember that you have the choice of whether or not you listen to that voice or not. For those of you that have decided to further your education to a, a secular uh, university, you may hear God's, uh, God's existence question. And you have to know right now that, man, my faith may be tested and you've got to decide which voice am I going to listen to? A person that believes in the existence of God or the one who doesn't? Those who transition, maybe not to, to, to a secular school, but those of you that, that transition to, to the workforce may find yourself surrounded by people who don't have a relationship with God. The fruit of their life may expel God out of that life. And you've got to decide right now in this transitional moment of your life. And that is that, man, who, who am I, I going to listen to? And what am I going to listen to? You've got to make a choice. Just like Joshua did within scripture, Joshua had all of these people that, that he was leading and surrounded by. And many of the people were, were worshiping false gods and, and following false entities and all of these various things. And Joshua looks to everyone and says, listen, you rascals, y'all can do what you want to do. But let me just tell you what me and my family is going to do. Me and my house are going to serve the Lord. And in that moment, he made that decision and, and he chose to listen to the right voice. And we see the end result of his life. He was exposed and experienced the true blessing and favor of God. But we've got to make a choice. So tonight, this is, I guess, really what, I, what I'm saying. And I challenge you to make the decision tonight to listen to the right voice. I want to say just real quickly one more time that your decision will determine the trajectory of your life here on earth. But most importantly... The voice that you listen to will determine where you will spend eternity, but also who you will bring with you. And that's important. So tonight, as I become full circle and I, I, I come full circle with this message, I, I want to share with us three voices from Scripture. It's not going to be going to be long, but real short. But I want us to, to pay close attention because there's three voices in Scripture that we find. And I, I want you to decide which voice you're going to listen to. The very first voice that we're going to be confronted with in life, that's not just for these graduates, that's for each and every one of us that's here tonight at, at this Bacular service. The first voice that you've got to understand is the voice of, of others. The voice of others. I want you just for a moment, most of us are familiar with, with the story of Jesus. We, most of us are familiar with Jesus and his crucifixion. Jesus had friends and he had people in his life, a man by the name of Peter, who said, man, I'm not going to deny you. I've got your back, Jesus. I'm, I'm your ride or die. We're going to go through this and whatever they do to you, they're going to have to do to me. He had the sons of thunder, James and John, right? That sounds more like a WWE tag team wrestling uh, people, right? But he looked at them and they said, man, we, we've got your back. But we find that as Jesus was, was led to Calvary and as Jesus was, was hung upon the cross, we find that his friends were silent. Many were hiding there. There were no voice there as Jesus hung upon the cross. In fact, his supporters were quiet. And there was no positive voice in that hour for Jesus to listen to. As you study the crucifixion of Jesus and, and as you come onto the scene of what was going on in that part of his life, we find that there was thief. There was a thief that mocked him. We, we look at Roman soldiers that mocked him. They beat him. They, they tore his garments. They hurled insult, uh, insults at him. We see that, that the religious people that were supposed to be looking for his coming were actually mocking and accusing him of being something that he wasn't. And in that moment, as Jesus was, was hanging upon the cross, now can you imagine, I mean, the whole reason why he is here is because of us. 
The whole reason that he was hanging on the cross was so that those that were lost could be found. And yet, here all of these different people represented at the foot of the cross were mocking and laughing and rejecting and cursing and, and, and gambling for his garments and all of these various things. And so, Jesus, as he hung on the cross, had to listen to the voices that mock words like, If you are the Son of God, save yourself and us. We see these religious insults found in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 42 when he said he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is, he is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we, we will believe him. But this is the reality tonight of listening to others' voices. If Jesus in the moment of hanging upon the cross would have listened and caved to those thieves, if he would have listened and caved to those religious people that were hurling insults and rejecting him, if he would have caved to the pressure of those voices, then friends, let me just say this right now, and that is that the 30 plus years that he lived on this earth would have been for nothing. There was a lot hinging on what voices Jesus listened to. And let's just be real, let's keep it real tonight, that if you and I were Jesus... And we were hanging on the cross and the people that we loved and the people that we were there and the people we had healed and the people that we had delivered were hiding and, and from the circumstance we were going through. If people were hurling insects, most of us would have said, you know what, get me off this cross and I'm going on back to heaven. Most of us would have done that. But Jesus, he allowed himself to receive the rejection and he refused to cave to the voices around him. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 7, says in him, talking about Jesus, that we have redemption. We have redemption through what? Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will and according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his counsel of his will. Verse 12 says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until acquire possession of it, the praise of his glory. Guys, let me just say this and encourage you with this. That man, that as you live, as you live your life, moving this day forward, Live it with the, the understanding that just like with Jesus in some of your most challenging seasons, often the loudest voice you hear is the voice of your accusers, is the voice of those that are not, not for you. We must act as Christ did, anchoring ourselves on why we are here in the first place and allowing the voice of his word and the voice of truth to serve as our motivation to push through some of the greatest times of adversity. The second voice that, that we should identify is the voice of our friends. Now, this is a, a hard one, but what I've learned is this, and that is that it has been proven that you become the average of the five people that you hang around the most. What does that teach us? It teaches us that your circle is important. In the Bible, there was a young man by the name of David. David was a young shepherd boy and he had older brothers that were more physique and, 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 and older and more mature. And long story short, uh, David was, 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 was uh, uh, coming to a point to where he was bringing like a sandwich, a cheese sandwich to his older brothers. And as he did, uh, he showed up and, and long story short, David in that point was anointed king over or, or to be king over Israel. And the story of the Bible tells us that when God called him to be king, he did not immediately become king. But the Bible tells us that there was a man by the name of Saul and Saul was the king of Israel and Saul initially loved David. David could, could play the, 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 he could, he could play the musical instrument and it would bring peace and it would soothe Saul's spirit and soul. But there was this point of, of transition to where Saul became jealous of David. For whatever reason, people liked David and people talked about liking David and it gave birth to a jealousy uh, in Saul's heart towards David. Long story short, Saul wanted David dead. He, he put a contract, if you will, out on his life. And so David and his friends were, were running for their life and they had done nothing wrong. And there's this part of the story in 1 Samuel 24 where David and his friends are hiding in a cave. And as they're hiding in a cave, they're back and all of a sudden here comes Saul. 
and Saul had to take a bathroom break. And so, so, so Saul goes into the cave and he starts, he starts using the bathroom. Now here's David over here. He's hiding and David's friends are like, now's your chance. Get him. And in this moment, Saul was vulnerable and, and Saul was, was in a, I mean, it was an opportune moment. And if you think, if you're in, if you're in David's sandals just for a moment, David had every right to go and try to kill Saul because Saul was trying to kill him. So, so David's friends are saying, hey, there, there is, there's the king. He's the one that's been after you. And the voice that David is hearing is to kill the king. And so in this moment, David had to make a decision. Am I going to listen to the voice of my friends or am I going to listen to what God's word says? So David looks to his friends and he says, I, I, I can't do it. Look at, look at 1 Samuel 24, 3 through 5. It says, and he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went there to relieve himself. He had to take a bathroom break. And now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give you your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. And then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner to Saul's robe. But David had to make a decision in this story. He hadn't done anything wrong. And here Saul was trying to kill him. But notice the words of his friends were directing David in the opposite direction. Of God's word. I want you to look at what David says in verse 6. We'll put it on the screen. And David looks to his friends and he says, look. He said to them, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David looked to them and said, hey, listen, I know you're my boys. I know, I know you've had my back. I know, I know that you would, man, you would fight for me and fight with me, but, but we can't do that. And the reason why we can't do it is, is because God's word says that's my anointed. And because he's my anointed, I can't touch him. And in this moment, it teaches us that we have to be careful because I truly believe, and it's just my opinion, that had David listened to his friends and killed Saul, I don't know if it would not have affected the, the complete trajectory of the rest of his life. But he chose to listen to God's word to the vo rather than the voice of, of his friends. So what that teaches us, that as you transition in life, let God's word always be your measuring rod between distinguishing the various voices. Because sometimes some voices seem good. Some voices seem all right. But sometimes it doesn't match with God's word. And let God's word be the measuring rod for your decisions. Every decision. You go to college and you, you, you go to the next phases of your life, let God be the measuring rod for everything that you do. If something is taught to you that is contrary to God's word, it's a lie. If something is demonstrated against God's word, it is a lie because God's word is good, not just yesterday, not just today, but good forever. So we got to be careful to the voices we listen to, the voice of others, the voice of our friends. But man, it's probably the most important voice that you'll ever listen to. Be the voice of God. And I close, I close with, with this. For those that come to church here on Sunday, knows usually three closes and we're finished. Y'all supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> the voice of God. Um, in order to, to learn the voice of God, you have to go all the way back. You have to go all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. You have to go to the, to, to the book of, of beginnings known as Genesis. And as you go back to verse, chapter, verse 17 of chapter 2 of Genesis. The Lord looks to his creation, Adam and Eve, and he looks and this is what he says. He says, but of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for the day in which you eat it, you will surely die. God looked at these, these, these two folks, Adam and Eve, and he said, man, you can have anything in this garden. How many of y'all like buffets? I like buffets, right? One, two, three. Every one of y'all heathens like buffets. I know I see, I see how big some of us is like me. Hey Amen. We like buffets. And so God, God looks at them and God says, man, in, in here in the garden, you can have everything. It's like a big, huge buffet. You can have from here. You can have there. You can, there's just this one place you cannot have. And the voice of God says, this is the instruction. This is, this is my voice for your life and keeping you in alignment with my, my plan for your life. Well, then shortly after God does that, the next chapter in Genesis chapter 3, uh, a serpent comes, also known as Satan comes. And in verse 4 of, of, of Genesis chapter 3, look what Satan says. He says, but the serpent said to the woman, you surely won't die. You see, that's, 
that's the voice battle that we have. The voice of God, the voice of the enemy, and you and I must come to a place in our life as we transition to make a decision. What voice are we going to listen to? The way we learn God's voice is God's voice will always line up, will line up with his word. Now, I close with this seriously. This is the finished one right here. There will, be, there will be times in this thing that we call life when there will be a voice that says, do what you want, live how you want, and there's not going to be any consequences. But I can't help remember when I think about that statement or where that led me years ago. 44 years to be exact in Toys R Us. I will always remember that. Several memories of my dad, and that's one of them, the Billy Belt. But the voices that you and I listen to can determine, listen, it can determine the success or failure of our mission in this thing we call life. I finished with a story. Story of an old battleship. It was an American battleship, to be exact, that was fighting a storm at sea. And as they were fighting this battle on radar, there was this unknown vessel that began to, to be on, on the radar and it was spotted directly in front of this battleship. So as I began to read this story, I found the transcript that I wanted to, to share between these two vessels. And this is what it said. The battleship said this, unknown vessel, turn your vessel 10 degrees west. Then in response, the unknown vessel responded by saying negative, turn your vessel 10 degrees. The battleship to the unknown vessel this is the USS Battleship Arizona. Turn your vessel around now. When the unknown vessel said, USS Arizona, we are a lighthouse. It's your call. <laughs> the voice that we listen to will determine the direction that we walk and whether or not we realize God's promises and plans for our life. We battle three voices, the voices of others, the voices of our friends, and then we look at the voices of God. But our decision to look to the right thing will determine the trajectory of our life, not just here on this world, but the most important world that awaits us, and that is the kingdom that God has built for us. I encourage you, choose the right voice. Choose the right voice to entertain, and God will bless you. God will flow and open doors for your life. That your mom, your dad, your pastor, your friends, your family, nobody can, God will open doors for your life that you and yourselves could not do if you listen to the right voice. I'm going to ask tonight, one of my dear friends, Brother Jack Sloan, is going to come tonight and pray a concluding prayer over you. Can we give our seniors, though, one more good hand clap tonight? Twenty-five minute sermon, right there, buddy. Are you done? That's a world record, baby. All right, praise the Lord. <laughs> God's good to us, ain't He? Y'all all look real good today. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here tonight. Amen. And I want to say thank you first and foremost to Stigler First for allowing us to have our backlit service here tonight. Amen. So let's give it up for them tonight. Amen. For the church in whole. I want to say thank you to our administration at Stigler High and Stigler Grade, all of our school, public school. I want to say thank y'all for what y'all do. Amen for what y'all do with our, our children, our young students. We appreciate y'all taking them off of our hands for a half a day or more. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we thank all y'all for that. Amen. I got in trouble this morning, and I ain't going to tell it, but anyway, I got threatened tonight when I got up here even. Before I got up here, I told a joke this morning at church. They said, don't tell that joke tonight. I'm not going to tell it either. <laughs> Amen. So praise the Lord. But the Lord's good to us today. Amen. We appreciate our town, Stigler, Oklahoma. We appreciate being a part of it. Amen. For 25 years, we've been pastoring at Stigler River of Life. Amen. We've seen a lot of children go through our high school and been a part of a lot of it. Amen, and we, it's just a great place to be, a great place to pastor, and we just hope we see many more days, many more years, amen, being where we're at right now. So I uh, want to pray. Lord, we come to you today looking to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. 
As thy word says in the book of Psalms, so thy word shall be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray as these young students make their next step in the journey, I pray, Lord, let that light so shine. That lighthouse that the brother talked about a while ago, Lord God, that it looks in oh so many different directions for us, Lord. I pray, Lord, for our students Lord, as they go forth. I pray that their ears will hear and hear what the Lord has to say to them. And I pray, Lord, that their hands be swift and as they work consistently, Lord, and Lord, and make what you want them to be, Lord. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that their hearts just be pure, Lord, and as they just give all their hearts to you, Lord God, seeking you first, the kingdom of God, and all of its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto them, Lord. And we know, Lord, there's great things in store for each and every one of these young students today. And I pray, God, Lord, that you just open the windows of heaven. You continue to pour them out a blessing, Lord. And I pray a hedge of protection up over each and every one of them tonight. God, I just know that the enemy walks them out as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. But I know today, God, Lord, Lord, that you can put a hedge of protection, that blood that the brother preached about earlier, Lord. I pray that, God. I pray for that young man tonight, God. I pray tonight, Lord. I know with no doubt you're the healer of all. And I'm just going to look into you tonight. And I pray as we go forth, God, that we'll continue. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities in our town, Lord, that we can lift your name up above all names. So we thank you, Lord. And I give you all praise and all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, if y'all will stand with us, please. Appreciate y'all. Amen. Y'all are dismissed.